pode ir, né? Ok. Uh, boa tarde. Good afternoon. Guten uh, tag uh, for everybody. Uh, my name is Virgilio Viana, and uh, I have the privilege of just making the opening uh, address here uh, on behalf of the Alliance. Um, I'm just going to go very quickly. I, don't ha I have a couple of slides. I don't have uh, the whatever is used to pass it on. But basically what I'll do is to give a, a very brief overview of RED in, in, in Brazil from a non-governmental standpoint. So what I'll be saying here, it's not necessarily uh, the position of the Brazilian government. So we are in a side event, so it's an open discussion. Um, and uh, basically what we have now is a very preoccupying uh, scenario and I imagine many of you have seen the, uh, uh, the new science paper which has shown that tropical forests are turning from sources, uh, I'm sorry, from sinks to sources of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. So that's not only in the Amazon. So it seems that uh, increasing uh, temperature worldwide is making forests more vulnerable to fire. And these fires are becoming mega fires. And this is very worrisome. So I think that's the backdrop of, of what we, um, we have in, in the case of the Brazilian Amazon. And this slide just, this slide just shows you know, some very basic numbers. The general picture for Brazil is actually very positive. Brazil has reduced more emissions than the Kyoto Protocol altogether. So deforestation has been reduced from 27 to about 5. And now it's back up again to around uh, 8,000 square kilometers per year. Uh, so that's very positive. Most of the, the Amazon is still forests, uh, as you can see in this uh, map. Um, about 82% is covered by forests. In the case of the state of Amazonas, where I come from, it's uh, more than that, it's around 97%. Um, but the trend is preoccupying. All what you see in red are uh, forest fires. Um, and what I've just mentioned to you, the issue of forests becoming more vulnerable to forest fires, this is the science paper I mentioned to you, uh, which shows a worldwide picture of tropical forests all uh, across the globe, and basically the, the message is that forests are becoming net uh, uh, sources, and this may increase at, as global temperature increases. Um, and not only small fires, but huge mega fires with very little ability of being controlled. And this has made up the news, so we have uh, the, the past month as a record in terms of forest fires. This uh, number is uh, increasing, sort of every year forest fires are becoming vo more vulnerable. And they are not only a result of climate change and warming, they are associated with uh, land use dynamics, especially uh, forest degradation as a result of illegal logging, encroaching land grabbing, and, and those processes that drive the agricultural frontier. Uh, this, uh, if Gabi could just kick in there for me, this is a, a picture taken about uh, two weeks ago uh, in the town of Umaita in southern state of Amazonas. And what you see in the back is the uh, headquarters of IBAMA, which is the Brazilian Protection Agency, being burned. Uh, and this, this fire was set by illegal gold miners. Um, and I think I can't see the, uh, uh, the... Can you just kick in the bottom of this slide? to see if a, a little animation comes up. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is, this was a cell phone video of uh, the, the, the uh, headquarters of, of Ibama being burned down. It was completely burned down. All the documents were burned down. All the cars were burned down. Uh, just to give you a flavor that this is not a, uh, an academic issue to be discussed only on PowerPoints, there are a lot of fights going on. And this is another picture a couple of months ago of a, a truck 
uh, full of new trucks, pickup trucks, uh, of Ibama, again, in the southern state, or in the nearby state of Pará, which was burned down completely by loggers, by illegal loggers. So what we say here as conflicts, uh, this is not peaceful stuff. It, there are a lot of uh, violence and, and uh, a lot of deaths, actually, around 10 to 20 leaders usually die every year as a result of it, usually representatives of small farmers. So the question of this session, what is missing uh, for Red Plus in Brazil to take off? Um, I have a, a long paper that I presented last month in, in a, uh, the International Conference for Sustainable Development in New York, uh, and I invite you all to have a look at it. It has a sort of more dis detailed description of it. But basically, uh, the story is that deforestation and degradation is a result of a complex set of factors. And um, Red Plus uh, right now is uh, lacking enough funding. And here we have to take note of the success story of the Amazon Fund managed by BNDS, which is very positive. However, it has been able just uh, to, to secure about 6% of the total uh, emission reductions that Brazil has uh, managed to, to achieve uh, since 2005. So there is a need of more uh, and additional funding to pick up not only those reductions, but also to meet the needs of investing. Reducing forest fires, deforestation, and encroachment is not a costless en enterprise. And oftentimes, that is the, the, the perception that people think that it's an issue of police and it's just a decree or a new law, a new forest code is going to do, do it. It's not. It requires an investment of billions of dollars on, on a number of things, which I'm not going to elaborate here. So I think time, Pedro, uh, is ripe for a change in policy in public policies uh, as it relation as related to, to Red Plus. And in my view, some old paradigms need to be revised. And the question is, um, why not use Red Plus as offsets? Especially given the fact that the Paris Agreement is not going to have its targets met uh, with the current pledges. The emission gaps report, which was just released, is about 3.2 degrees. So uh, the agreement uh, has an aspiration of 1.5 or 2. So we're far from Why not include uh, uh, offsets? And I know that some people have strong thoughts about this. And I think this is going to be a great opportunity for us to discuss uh, whether or not it makes sense uh, to revisit uh, offsets as added on commitments not as a substitute for the commitments. And a lot of people have uh, strong thoughts against uh, using red as offsets, but oftentimes this is based on the assumption that red plus being cheap can uh, let people off the hook and not do their homework. But what I think we are saying is something different. In addition to the commitments, everything should be neutral. I think our lives should be neutral. For example, the case of, uh, that we're going to discuss in the panel, uh, aviation, all of us, or many of us, uh, have taken airplanes to come to, to Bonn. But most of us didn't pay for those emissions. And we should have paid for those emissions. It's basically not acceptable anymore uh, to have these kinds of emissions not accounted for. So I think we should have these offsets, not only in the aviation sector, but also in other sectors. Uh, I think the uh, energy supply of this particular conference should have an offset. Uh, although Germany is making very positive steps in terms of renewable energy, um, my understanding is about a third of, of Germany is, is, is renewables. Uh, but then there's two thirds which should be uh, offset. And likewise, the food that we eat in a restaurant, all of this has a footprint. And my question is, shouldn't we have a sort of a more ambitious way in, of, of uh, uh, compensating for our emissions? And if that is the case, uh, Red Plus may be one of the best options, because it brings together biodiversity conservation, rainfall, 
uh, protection and poverty alleviation issues. So uh, I'd like to, to, to leave you with that. And, and finally, um, to keep in my 10 minutes opening uh, here, is, is the issue of um, market-based instruments, not only offsets, but also market-based. Shouldn't we make use of non-governmental funds, because the Amazon fund, for example, is based on, on the donation of Norway to Brazil. It's government to government. But that doesn't unleash uh, the uh, capital that is necessary. And, and there is uh, amazing liquidity in the world's market. And we should just harness all of this, or some of this uh, capital, into doing good and doing good for the planet. I'm sure it requires investment in red greater than what we see at the moment. So on this note, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity and uh, invite Pedro to come over. Pedro, please, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I don't know if I know how to manage this. So my name is Pedro uh, Soares. I'm the manager of the Climate Change and Red Plus program at IDESAM, the Institute for Conservation and Sustainable Development of the Amazon. That's a Brazilian NGO that has been working with Red Plus uh, for the past 13 years. So reminding that this event is being carried out by the Brazilian Red Plus Alliance, uh, all the institutions are presented here on the slide, that are a group of Brazilian institutions working towards uh, promoting innovative strategies for Red Plus in Brazil, and also some fi finance models to reduce deforestation uh, in the Brazilian Amazon. Among the main contributions of the Alliance to the Red Plus debate, uh, is the creation of the integrated Red Plus market concept that we, we will explore uh, a little bit more here during this event. But just as a background before exploring the concept, it's really worth reminding that uh, land use change in deforestation represents the main sector of greenhouse gas emissions in Brazil in the past 15, year, 15 years, and is re represented in this graphic uh, by the green by the green section. And although the historical contribution to the climate change problem, uh, the land use sector was also responsible for most of the, uh, the greatest emission reductions in Brazil. So from 2005 up to 2015, deforestation in the Amazon decreased by 80%. The emissions of over 5 billion tons of CO2 was avoided. And we can also see this decrease reflected here on this first graphic. But the most interesting thing is that if we exclude the land use sector from this analysis, the result is that greenhouse gas emissions in Brazil from other sectors, as energy, industry, and transport, for example, increased by 20% in the past uh, 10 years. So it means that the Amazon forests are responsible for most of emission reductions in Brazil, but still represent just 8% of Brazilian gross domestic product, and it is still in a really fragile socioeconomic position. Uh, so this, this second graph is just to represent the red plus potential uh, in the Brazilian Amazon up to 2020 based on historical deforestation rates in the Amazon. And the reference level, or the baseline scenario established by the national policy of, on climate change and also the, the national targets of, for reducing uh, a, a deforestation in the Amazon by 80% up to 2020, we have an uh, overall potential of generating more than 9 billion tons of red plus credits up, up to 2020 in this past uh, uh, 15, 15 years. And, and it is basically one of the greatest contributions that a single country can make to the uh, climate change mitigation. Out of this total, uh, the Amazon has already generated more than 5 billion tons of emission reductions 
and, and out of this total, as, as Virgilio said, uh, we managed to finance ab about 6% of the overall potential of red credits generated so far, as showed here in the graphic. So we have a really rich field to explore on how to increase finance uh, performance for Red Plus in Brazil, and that's where the integrated Red Plus concept fits. It is a really simple concept, actually. Basically, it's to promote uh, separate but complementary carbon markets so that Red Plus credits do not affect, for example, price for other mitigation mechanisms, for example, under the Sustainable Development Mechanism of the Paris Agreement. Supplementary requirements can be adopted, both in terms of domestic reductions and also to external offsets. And the supplementary concept requires that countries meet a significant proportion of emission reductions domestically before using uh, offsets. Uh, at the same time, the inclusion of red plus markets would ensure access to finance incentives to tackle this important source, source of emission and could reduce the average cost for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in Brazil. Uh, so this is basically the, the, the background. Uh, also worth reminding that if we consider uh, red plus markets, we could turn the, the, the Brazilian national targets from a negative uh, cost to a positive cost. We could generate the, the, the volume that we could generate by transaction, just the surplus of emission reductions by, by red plus, we could make NDC uh, feasible on an economic perspective. And, and to discuss this topic, so just like to invite to join the panel, uh, uh, Sylvain, please, if you could join the, the panel here for discussion. Uh, so just for properly, properly present everyone, we have here uh, Thiago Chagas, legal consultant from Climate Focus, uh, Virgilio Viana, General Director of uh, Amazonas Sustainable Foundation, Sylvain Gupil, the Manager Director of Autilla Climate Fund, and Chris Mayer, uh, Senior Manager on Tropical Forest Policy of the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, so the proposal here is that I, I will make initial question to each one of you, and then you have uh, like 10, 15 minutes to speak about that. And my first question is exactly to Thiago. I think that Thiago, you have some uh, slide to show. So if you could please just change to Thiago's presentation. That is the next one. And while they are changing, Thiago, my question to you is that uh, the sustainable development mechanism under the, the Paris Agreement, it could represent a major opportunity for Red Plus Finance in the post-2020 period. So what is the regulatory framework under UNFCCC for this matter? And is Red Plus an eligible mechanism to participate in the SDM? So please. If you don't mind, Pedro and the audience, I will be sitting here because I need to see sure. the slides from here. Up. I think you can change it. It's the green one? Yeah. Yep. OK, thank you very much, Pedro, for the, for the introduction and for inviting for this kind invitation to discuss um, regulatory options for Red Plus or entry points for Red Plus finance under the Paris Agreement. So I think it's a bit broader than just looking at one particular article, the 6.4 Sustainable Development Mechanism. And um, well, I'll, I'll explain the other options as we go through. Is the green one there? So, we actually achieved a point where Red Plus is moving quite fast from readiness and implementation to delivering results. Um, the Warsaw framework for Red Plus was adopted in 2013 and foresees the main steps and methodological processes for measuring results and accessing results-based payments and has also been fully grounded into Article 5 of the Paris Agreement. Now, no one really doubts that results-based payments in line with the Warsaw Framework are critical for Red Plus implementation, but it's highly unlikely 
that only funds flowing from the Green Climate Fund, from the GCF, or Norway, or Germany, in line with the Warsaw framework, will be enough to trigger and to sustain the scale of results we all expect from Red Plus. So in that sense, it is almost certain that we will need to go beyond this mode of development aid that we have right now and find additional ways to finance Red Plus. And indeed, the Article 6 cooperative approaches that we have in the Paris Agreement may offer that alternative route. Now, to better phrase that, it's not necessarily an alternative route, but it's better uh, to put it as a complementary route, so uh, on top of results-based payments foreseen um, with Red Plus. Um, there are the two points that I think is worth mentioning with the Warsaw framework. One is that um, essentially it was designed as a results-based payment system, but it does not preclude other forms of cooperation and other forms, other approaches. So market-based approaches could actually be developed and used in the context of RED with the qualifier that maybe further um, modalities for verification of results may need to apply for RED Plus to fit into a market-based system. The second issue is that uh, it has been more than 10 years now that um, the countries have been negotiating Red Plus. It has somehow, somehow advanced faster than other areas in international negotiations. And I would say that it's likely that Red Plus is currently the sector that is one, or at least one of the most prepared sectors to incorporate other types of finance based on performance. So, in fact, Red Plus has not only spearheaded the, the, the notion of results-based payments that we know today in the context of climate change, but could also pilot cooperative approaches under Article 6.2. Now, the question becomes how this could actually work. Um, so, as you know, the Paris Agreement provides uh, a number of alternatives for parties uh, to cooperate to achieve their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions. And actually, the first option for cooperation is not depicted in this graph. It's actually outside Article 6, and it is through the possibility of a joint submission of an NDC. So it is conceivable that two countries establish an agreement and notify that secretariat that within this agreement, they intend to achieve a joint NDC pledge, which also covers Red Plus. So let's assume that in this joint NDC, Red Plus would be covered and emission reductions would be counted against a single NDC. So this opportunity may take place, for instance, in the context of regional economic integration, or also outside it. And it has been foreseen under Articles 14, 4.15 to, sorry, 4.16 to 4.18. Now, coming back to the focus of this presentation, which is on Article 6, um, Article 6 essentially provides three pathways uh, the first one is the Article 6.2, cooperative approaches. The second one is Article 6.4. It's a centralized mechanism, which is also known as the Sustainable Development Mechanism. And the other one is Article 6.8, which will deal with no market-based cooperation. Um, we will actually go through each one of them, and we start bottom-up according to the perceived potential that they may offer for further Red Plus finance. Uh, I guess Red Plus under Article 6.8, in the way Article 6.8 is designed, would not really differ much from what we have today in the Warsaw framework. So what we see in 6.8 are no market-based approach. So potentially for Red Plus, this would mean results-based payment in the pure notion, the conventional notion that we know today, which means there is no transfer of emission reductions from one country to another. Still, as I understand from negotiations so far, some countries would like to see an explicit link between 6.8 and Red Plus, whereas other countries would prefer not to have that link because they believe this could 
actually end up diverting attention from other possibilities of non-market-based cooperation that could arise under Article 6.8. Now, for 6.4, 6.4, the Sustainable Development Mechanism, and the question that Pedro raised, um, is also a possibility and an entry point for Red Plus. But uh, given the fact that it is a centralized mechanism with modalities and procedures to be agreed by the CMA, centrally and internationally by the CMA, the Conference of the Parties, the Meetings of the Parties for the Paris Agreement, it may be required a specific authorization for Red Plus to find its way into Article 6.4. Now, if we consider um, the whole history of the CDM and avoided deforestation, and, and to the extent that the CDM, this is also painting, but to the extent that the CDM may be fully reflected into this Article 6.4 mechanism. So this may actually prove a more difficult, or let's put it, politically challenging option for Red Plus. Um, still, there are some arguments. So there are some countries and analysts that say that um, this Article 6.4, the Sustainable Development Mechanism, may eventually become some sort of a standard of standards. So rather than simply approving activities, it could also approve mechanisms and other standards. Uh, and according to this argument, it would be possible that the Red Plus as a mechanism in line with the Warsaw framework could also be endorsed by this future 6.4 board. Now, apparently this, this proposal or this notion has not gained a lot of traction with the Article 6 community, so with negotiation, negotiators of Article 6, because no one really knows how this could actually be operationalized. And this may actually bring additional complexity to something that is already quite complex. The other option is a more simple one. Uh, it's essentially that um, activities within Red Plus could be submitted uh, to the 6.4 board once it is established, and these activities could be registered and lead to Article 6.4 units. And these could be, for instance, the same ones as we have today in the CDM, uh, such as afforestation and reforestation with native uh, vegetation. Now, this is a quite limited option. It mimics what we have today in the CDM, but certainly would not be ideal for Red Plus as a whole. Uh, then we come to, the, to Article 6.2, which, in contrast to Article 6.4, provides a decentralized alternative for cooperation among countries. Uh, where, for instance, countries that achieve or that have mitigation results or mitigation outcomes that exceed the NDC pledge, so that are over and above the, their NDC pledge, could actually transfer those mitigation outcomes to another country, and this other country would use those emission reductions or mitigation outcome and count against their own NDCs. Um, being a more decentralized mechanism, the way it was designed, uh, it is more likely that this option, this Article 6.2, would provide greater leeway or better, more flexibility for countries to define their scope of their cooperation and include Red Plus in that, provided, of course, that this, this inclusion of Red Plus ends up being compatible with the guidance that will be established, the general guidance that will be established under Article 6.2. So in terms of regulatory options and, and how to operationalize this, uh, there are essentially two views so far, and as I've been able to gather is, one of them is that countries, some countries and some analysts say that nothing else would be needed given the way the centralized nature of Article 6.2, so nothing else would be needed for Red Plus to be included as a cooperative approach in here. So no additional step, no additional decision would be needed for this. So countries could simply engage in a bilateral way or plurilateral way and decide to include Red Plus in it. Another view is that it refers back to the Warsaw framework, where there is a decision, if I'm not mistaken, decision 14, um, of COP19, where it refers that um, 
specific, further specific modalities for verification of results may be needed if Red Plus is to fit into a market-based system. So if this is the prevail, uh, if, it is, if this is the view prevailing, then this would, be, this would require a new decision by the CMA in this case, potentially. Now, indeed, it is the case that, um, that we will actually have, or at least the way negotiations are advancing Article 6.2, it is likely that we have additional conditions under Article 6.2, one of them being third-party independent verification of results. So to the extent that the Warsaw framework does not foresee this, this would be needed as well for Red Plus to fit into Article 6.2, in addition to corresponding adjustments and all other requirements that may come over. So just to, to conclude, because I think I passed my, my foreseen time here, I'm sorry for that. Um, so essentially, the options for Red Plus entry points would be the pure results-based payments that we already have with no transfer of ERs, and that's under the Warsaw framework for Red Plus and Article 5 in the Paris Agreement, then Article 6.8, then a more nuanced version of results-based payments where you have a transfer of emission reductions that could be through 6.2, more likely, and also through 6.4, and finally through a joint NDC where countries decide to cover red plus into this joint NDC. That's it. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much, Thiago. Uh, and we will have time to go back to these points afterwards when we open to the audience. Uh, but I would just move, would like to move forward and, and, and ask to, to Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, EDF has been an active stakeholder under ICAO uh, negotiations. And the recent approved carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation, or, or CORSIA, from ICAO, uh, is another international mechanism with great potential for finance red plus and forest conservation in the Amazon. So how is Corsia designing its mitigation mechanism and what are the opportunities for red plus to engage in, in Corsia? Uh, thank you, and I think I just have one slide that if you don't mind loading, but uh, you did a very good job with that very difficult acronym, uh, Corsia, uh, as you said, carbon offsetting reduction scheme for international aviation, another one, uh, ICAO or I ICAO uh, is the International Civil Aviation Organization, and that is the UN body that uh, governs all uh, the aviation sector globally. All countries uh, participate in it, and all aviation companies also have to uh, basically uh, abide by those rules, and that keeps us safe, and amongst other things. And they're now looking at uh, a pledge they've made to basically be carbon neutral uh, going forward or zero carbon growth going forward after 2020. You can see on the graph here, they're capping the emissions at the 2020 level uh, and have basically three different ways they want to reduce their or, or meet these, uh, maintain this cap. One would be the operational improvements, so better aircraft, more technical uh, fuel efficient engines, et cetera. You have also you know, potential biofuels uh, that would be used that would be considered carbon neutral. There's a whole conversation happening about that. But what's projected to be needed is a significant amount of offsets. Okay, uh, you can see there's 7.8 billion tons from during the period that this is supposed to, to run from by uh, 2020 to 2040. Uh, this is not meant to basically, as you can see, it, it of course, increases and at the moment um, most of these would probably uh, these offsets land on emerging markets uh, like Brazil, uh, Asia, uh, Africa where there are more and more uh, flights being created and, and between countries etc. Um, and this is all international aviation sorry this is not domestic aviation when you look at this. So um, all that said is basically Brazil itself is going to have a, a let's say, a responsibility here, and it's going to be needing, uh, or companies that are going to be flying to and from Brazil are going to be needing offsets, uh, in addition to many other countries uh, that don't necessarily uh, will be have a growing aviation sector and flights to them, again, most of the emerging markets. So over the last couple of years, and, and currently now is basically there's a, negotiation happening between 
countries on what the criteria should be for the emission units or the offsets to be used by the aviation sector. Um, there are various principles uh, that are now, at this moment, being discussed in Montreal. The, they are semi-public, and if you think this process here in the UFCCC is complicated, that process is even more complicated and non-transparent. We don't even have side events like this, uh, observers don't get access to it, and they have even more complicated acronyms than we have here. Um, but um, EDF participated there, and I think some other colleagues here from Brazil were there. And what we did here, and importantly there, was that there's been a lot of advocacy, especially from EDF, that RED, uh, especially jurisdictional national level programs, like Brazil's been doing and, and completed in the Warsaw Framework RED, would be able to contribute offsets uh, to the, the system, and the aviation sector could be able to use those. Um, Unfortunately, in this space too, what we hear from the Brazilian negotiators in that space is that they're not for RED being able to use. And so, unfortunately, a lot of this potential demand for a lot of the reductions that you, I think it was 9.6, 9.5 gigatons or a billion tons that you've already occurred and potentially many more, uh, Brazilian airlines or airlines flying to Brazil would not be able to use as offsets. Um, also, uh, we heard just this other day in Montreal a similar thing by the Brazilian there negotiating on, in the ICAO space uh, in Montreal now, again, this emission units criteria that red should not be, countries don't want red and it's not allowed under the UNFCCC, for example, uh, arguing not exactly what our colleague just presented under 6.2 and those different options. So uh, this is difficult uh, because, at least from any of us' perspective, it's not helpful for, you know, generating in revenue for Brazil to fight deforestation. Of course, I think we saw some very powerful slides by Inversely, you know, this is a battle where we need more resources for the government and other actors to push back against. Uh, unfortunately, what Brazil is, negotiators are pushing in there to be used to offset that would come from Brazil is CDM credits from your dams. And of course, I think there's a lot of concern around the quality of those uh, emission reductions are from the becoming from the CDM, the clean development mechanisms and those dams, in addition to, of course, the corruption associated with them in a lot of these cases, uh, additionality, uh, and I think there's also a number of companies that are uh, behind those projects that are being sued in federal court in the U.S., for example, because of the corruption associated with them. So those CDM credits that the Brazilians are saying that we want to be able to access and offset there is not, unfortunately, many would say a lot of environmental integrity uh, behind them or social integrity and other issues with them. Uh, they could have contributed to the corruption in, in Brazil. So uh, we therefore you know, are, are concerned about this. We see, uh, again, a lot of opportunity for, for RED for Brazil and many other tropical forest countries. And we would hope that the Brazilian position would, would change on this. I and mean, maybe there's some Brazilian government officials who can correct me there in the room. But that's our understanding of you know, what we've been hearing and how they've been presenting their positions. And that this could be, though, a very great opportunity for uh, financing for RED. And I think it was only 6% of emissions so far. <laughs> you know, there's 9.6 billion tons at five bucks a ton and it's $45 billion. Or, yeah, there's you know, big potential for this. As you can see, though, the, the potential is small at the beginning, but would scale substantially. And that would, of course, also, I was uh, parallel the need for Brazilian domestic companies to, to and from Brazil. So let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. So uh, moving forward, my next question goes to Sylvain. Uh, Sylvain Altilia Climate Fund is one of the most recognized players in the Red Plus uh, arena. And we are noting a growing interest, actually, in the private sector uh, to engage, engage with, with Red Plus, uh, as it maybe represents a great business opportunity in the next years. So under Altilia's perspective, how is Brazil and other Latin America countries advancing their regulations to promote private sector engagement with Red Plus? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pedro. My name is Sylvain Guppy. I'm a managing director of uh, Altilia Ecosphere, as you, as you rightly mentioned, uh, which is now Mirova Altilia, because we, we just merged with Mirova, which is a large 
uh, asset manager in France. Uh, we are focusing on financing land use change and, and conservation, working in, uh, well, globally, but mostly in Latin America, uh, financing activities with NGOs, with corporates, with uh, sometimes, you know, uh, governments. Um, we are active in Brazil a little bit, uh, in Peru and Colombia. Um, and, and maybe to, to give you a little bit of background, when we launched Altilia four years ago, it was really a, a red plus uh, play, if I may. So it was really banking on the, the, the soon to come or soon to arrive uh, red plus price to be able to finance activities uh, in terms of conservation, in terms of sustainable agriculture, in terms of uh, family farming that could basically, uh, you know, provide some uh, some supply of credits uh, and and have actual impact on the ground um, to be honest uh, it's not an easy task uh, we have seen a lot of amazing activities we've seen uh, real solutions in in many type of uh, of activities in terms of conservation in terms of uh, in commodities in in cocoa in coffee in uh, in palm oil uh, in cattle, we, we've made some, some good investments uh, in Brazil, in Mato Grosso, for uh, sustainable cattle ranching. Uh, but the reality is behind that, even though we, we can measure the impact of what we are doing in terms of uh, improved livelihoods, in terms of conservation, in terms of uh, red plus credits or red plus emission reductions, uh, the demand is not there. So uh, that's something which is quite uh, disappointing to be to be frank you have on the one hand uh, available techniques available solutions uh, a strong willingness uh, to operate the change on the ground and a strong need to to operate this change because of uh, uh, the urgency of adaptation to climate change uh, but because of this lack of of price signal, I'm not, not even talking about market and, and trading, I'm just talking about price signal for red, uh, it's very difficult to channel uh, such investments. We, we've been able to, uh, to channel about $150 million into the space. Uh, it's overall quite good project and it's reasonable investment, but what we believe is that uh, with a strong uh, price signal for red, it's it would be 150 billion, not 150 million, uh, that you know us and, and many other players could could play, um, could provide to to the economy, and uh, so you, it's a bit frustrating in the sense that you you had a time whereby you have all the solution ready, you, you're just missing the political signal. Um, Virgilio was talking about the, the need for the, the, the private sector, the private finance sector, to be involved and to create a non-government investment funds, I totally agree with him. I think that's a solution. Uh, you have solutions to basically for one dollar of public money to to raise, you know, five times or ten times this amount of, of private money, which will be good investment, good return and good impact on the ground. Uh, but right now, the, the, the reality is that red is not yet an asset class and, and we cannot see basically big money from insurance companies, pension funds, putting hundreds of millions and, uh, and billions into the, into the scheme. I don't want to be too depressing here, uh, but uh, we, we can see some lights of hope, uh, nevertheless. Uh, in Latin America, we, we, you were asking me about uh, my vision on that, a uh, couple of things which are quite interesting happening. Uh, in Colombia, you have this um, carbon tax, which can be basically compensated with, uh, with, uh, with uh, carbon credits. Uh, it has been implemented this year. Uh, it's it start to be significant volume. We're talking about you know 50 million per year. It's not huge, but it's still you know volume for, for a country which is, is not neglig neglectable. Um, so you can offset your, your five dollar tax by basically surrendering or pinning on the wall uh, credits. Uh, this year it was international credits. Next year it will be only uh, only Colombian credit and and red plus credit will be acceptable. So. There is some demand, and it's very really good that you can see some uh, 
local basically uh, mechanism happening. So local money from Colombia going to local projects in Colombia. So I, I like that very much. We also seeing some good progress in, in Peru. Uh, it seems that the uh, they have made good progress on nesting some some red plus project into their national system, so we should know more in the coming weeks. But it's it's really something which is quite interesting, and I think Peru has made a, a very interesting move. And I think that I hope that this will be uh, replicated uh, quite quite quickly. Now the big question is how we can link basically this nesting in Peru with other countries, and we, we go back to your. 6.2 article, um, and Brazil, uh, Brazil, eight, uh, difficult one. Uh, it's a bit frustrating also because you you can see a lot of a um, lot of potential. Uh, we are on the ground, so we, we can really see how to to, to provide this funding. Uh, to be honest, in terms of uh, Institutional framework. It's quite difficult to read and to understand. We we spend a lot of time there, and uh, and between the the, the federal level, the, the state level, and even the municipalities, it's it's very difficult to uh, to have a clear view. And and to be honest, as a as banker, as financer, if you don't have a clear framework, you, you, you're quite uh, reluctant to put to put money in that. So uh, so you need to believe in it, and you need to to show that this is possible. We I think we invested something like $30 million, uh, 30 more than that, uh, in Brazil in the last two years on activities which are, you know, uh, you know fully compliant with Red Plus approach. It's really uh, reducing emissions and, and uh, restoring degraded lands. But, you know, $30 million Brazil, that's just nothing. You know, it's, uh, again, you know, when... Uh, uh, we're in Mato Grosso. Mato Grosso is uh, the second largest exporter of beef, producer of beef in the world. Uh, so you, you you have to put billions on the table, not not a uh, few few millions. So having a, a functioning and uh, and uh, and understandable and and visible uh, red plus system uh, is is really something that we need. And we we're not that far away, but there is a real need to push. You know, all these guys in the Bula. Uh, in the Bula section to, to, to take decision and to take action because uh, you know I've been around for you know at this cup for well less than you or, or about the same time as you but a couple of years and uh, honestly the discussion that we're having today we, we had the same uh, you know five years ago ten years ago and fifteen years ago so uh, you know action is needed now okay, good. <laughs> really good thank you Sylvain uh, so I'd like to, to go back to, to Virgilio. Uh, Virgilio, Red Plus, it could represent a great opportunity for state governments and for the Amazon region to manage their economic situation, to invest in new technologies, to create new business opportunities and local strategies for dealing with deforestation. So actually, I think I have two questions. The first one is, what has been the main experience of the Sustainable Amazonas Foundation on Red Plus financing? And second, again, what's missing? What should we do to promote that fundraise for forest conservation in Brazil to go beyond 6% as we have showed before? Okay, could I have my slides, please? Just start on, on where we stopped, which was 15. Um, well, Thank you, Pedro. Uh, well, Amazonas Sustainable Foundation is the largest NGO of the Amazon. We currently work with uh, an area of 11 million hectares of protected areas in Brazil only. And um, this includes 583 communities uh, that live in these 11 million hectares. So it's a huge area, sort of by all Amazon uh, standards. Is, is large. And I have a very s simple two messages for you. First is that uh, Red Plus in practice can deliver results, uh, both in terms of uh, forests and, and, and people. And just to give you very brief uh, information on, on um, deforestation rates, though, so this is a summary of uh, 
the history of uh, de deforestation in, in these areas that I referred to. So in the first period, using these five years moving averages, it will reduce 28%, and in the second period, 37% after the beginning of this program called Bolsa Floresta. In terms of forest fires, looking at the data which is uh, firm, the last two years, uh, we have re reduced 48% uh, of forest fires. These different colors and different regions within the Amazon where we, we work. So just so here, just look at the blue, uh, which is the total. Um, and, and what's the answer for this? It's that in order to have good benefit sharing and to make sure that red uh, finance reaches the ground and makes sense for people and improve livelihoods, the message is very simple. Uh, it's participatory planning, education, and empowerment. And I don't have the time to go into details here, but there is a whole menu. By the way, we are uh, launching a menu uh, on, on this, which was funded by the Inter-American Development Bank, on, on the, so the social technology that FAS has developed in, to work with communities to deliver on the ground uh, these activities. And I'd just like here to, 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 share, to uh, share with you one piece of data. And this is a survey, and we have done a poll uh, with about 1,500 people interviewed by an independent polling agency. And just look at the case of the Rio Negro RDS, and RDS stands for Sustainable Development Reserve. And we asked the question, were there uh, changes in the community uh, after the beginning of, the, of this program? And in the case of Rio Negro, we asked the same question in 2011 and in 2015. And in 2011, 57% said that there were positive changes as a result of this program. And in 2015, we had 83% uh, changes in, in these uh, uh, people who found that there were positive changes. So we have a huge survey with 96 questions that just picked up one to illustrate sort of an overall picture that people are seeing that life has improved. So the, the main message I want to leave you with is that it's possible to uh, implement red in practice in a way that it's fair and it makes uh, good livelihoods. And how is that? And this is a picture that of last week, and this is a fair of Pirarucu, which is a big fish uh, from the Amazon. This was a, a fair that took place last week in at, at, our, at our headquarters in Manaus, and and this is to illustrate simple and practical action. In this case, is to engage communities to help them manage sustainably fisheries, and this fish occurs in lakes and is relatively simple to manage. Uh, the, on, on, on your uh, left-hand side, you see uh, a pirarucu fish being harvested, and it's possible to, to do an inventory of fish stocks in a lake just by counting those fish that come to the surface to breathe because they breathe air. So it's relatively simple to have a complete inventory of fish. So you can count the number of existing fish, and the harvesting uh, rate is about 10% per year, and that's very well documented by science being, as being sustainable. So one part of the story is to make uh, the uh, management sustainable, empower people to take control of their uh, natural resources, but the second part is to link those producers to markets so that they receive more uh, for their products, and they, they would otherwise, in a way, uh, put it it's simple, is to uh, bypass the middleman that oftentimes takes most of the profit. So this is a, uh, just a picture to illustrate uh, what kinds of things can be done. And I know that uh, Sylvain with Othelia is investing in chocolate and, 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 and other products. So there, there's a, a whole suite of things that can be done to increase, the, to increase the profitability of forest products. And in, the, in this case, fish, I, I, I have recognized a fish so as to become a forest species. It's a non-timber forest species because this fish, most of the time, they, they go into the forest when the forest is flooded to, to, to eat and, 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 and breed and so on. So the main, main message is to be concrete, 
have a benefit sharing that is based on participatory planning, uh, results uh, that can increase income so that forests are worth more standing and cut to people today. It's not enough to talk about the planet and how important it is to save biodiversity. It has to be as concrete as possible so as to change uh, uh, behavior. And, um, well, uh, I think we have to, to uh, uh, explore something new, and this is just I'd like to share, Pedro, with you all, uh, an area that is of increasing interest to us, which is the link between deforestation, forest fires, air pollution, and health. About a third of the heart attacks are caused by air pollution. And air pollution in the Amazon can be more acute than in places like Sao Paulo, which is a huge city, or London, uh, during the dry season when there are lots of forest fires. So it's very important for uh, people in different parts of Brazil to realize that missing the forest or losing forests is bad for us. It's also bad for the planet, but also it's bad for us. So it's a political economy issue here that we, we have to highlight the importance of health impacts. The same goes for, for Asia, uh, in, in case of, of Malaysia and Indonesia, where forest fires become a source of pollution for, for countries in, in that region. And I think we have to make the link, and there was a very interesting debate, I participated a couple of weeks ago at the Vatican on this, uh, showing how the link between health and air pollution was the trigger of innovative policies. So we have to, to incorporate that into the red debate. It's not only an issue of reducing deforestation because of climate change, but also it's a health issue. And I think that it can be a, 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 a game changer. And, and um, uh, another thought is that um, uh, the Amazon is too big to fail. Uh, that argument was used to save banks a couple of years ago because banks were said to be too big to fail. And I'm sure that the Amazon is much more valuable than a couple of you know, little banks in, in Wall Street, right? Uh, relatively speaking. Uh, so we have to put the finance together and we have to overcome the prejudices against uh, red uh, market-based financing and offsets. It's just unacceptable at this point with the level of urgency and crisis that we have ahead of us not to uh, to have uh, the private sector become a part of the solution as Sylvain very well described you know and 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 increase as well uh, you know, there's potential in the uh, uh, aviation sector why not use that there is appetite in, in the private sector. Why not use that? Why not do that in a way that we have shown in the Amazon that works for people and improve livelihoods? So I think we have to uh, make use of this COP to advance its agenda, and I hope that the Brazilian government goes in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Virgilio. Thank you to all the panelists, actually. So I just ask you to remain in your seats as we will now take a couple questions from, from the audience. So we can have like rounds of three questions each uh, and open the, the debate. So please just, just uh, say your name, institution, and, and to whom you want to ask your question. The question will come in Spanish from the president, from the person sitting next to me. She, she's from Peru, from the Peruvian organ, a women's organization. As necessary as you want, I can, I will translate a bit. She has a two-part question, which mainly has to do with the role of women and everything that you've spoken about. Uh, with the women in Peru are left aside a lot. And, and whatever plan is happening. You spoke, Virgil, about the Peru, or I think, uh, no, it was you who spoke about the Peruvian positive approach. Never heard of it, she said, so here goes her question. <laughs> bien, eh, bien eh, saludándole a cada uno de ustedes, este, en las exposiciones me hubiera gustado 
cuando se habla calidad de vida de las comunidades indígenas, muy poco se toma en cuenta el tema de mujeres indígenas. Got that? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sí. Bien. Uh, ya que somos las mujeres indígenas las más vulnerables dentro de las comunidades y asimismo somos nosotras las guardianas de los bosques, de nuestros territorios y somos las que permanecemos más en las comunidades con nuestros hijos. Me gustaría saber al respecto, ¿tienen alguna propuesta? ¿Alguno de ustedes? ¿Es todo claro? Sí. Ok. Gracias a lot. So we can take another question and then we just make one full round of answers here. Is there any other question? In terms of providing, my name is Felix, I'm independent. In terms of providing a financial incentive to non-indigenous communities in these regions, um, I see potential. Um, as for the indigenous communities, both women and men, um, how does creating some of these reserves restrict them from going about their traditional practices? Thank you. A third one? Claudia, I'm Brazilian. I'm living now in France and I would like to know in the discussion in Bula, in the negotiation properly with the government, do you think um, your approach uh, showing how do you work with, we're going to change the financement with Brazil, even though the government lost a lot of trust in uh, international... Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I think that uh, whoever feels comfortable to answer uh, the question uh, can, can do that. Uh, not sure if Sylvain wants to talk something about Peru or Vigilio about how you are uh, approaching the w women leaders in, under the Bolsa Floresa program. So please feel free to, to answer that. Well, I can uh, touch on, on all these three questions. Uh, in, start with the last from Claudia uh, from Brazil. Brazil, for those of you who are not very familiar, we're going to go. We're in a huge crisis, political crisis. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. Uh, we had a president ousted uh, last year uh, through a group which is now in power, and there is a number of corruption charges against this group which is now in power, and there is a big crisis of whether or not to oust this current uh, group which is in power. So, and the problem is that the, the current president is in a way in the hands of the, the Congress, which is very much connected with the interests of the agricultural sector associated with deforestation. So he is in a way uh, in, not in a position of being against, but rather being very much in favor of the positions defended by those congressmen. So it's very tough. Having said this, it seems that there is uh, a, a positive move, and I would say that largely because of the advances of the Brazilian Forum on Climate Change, which has been led by uh, Alfredo Cirquis, who is a very uh, interesting uh, representative uh, from from Rio de Janeiro, uh, who was a he's a previous congressman, but now no longer in office, and he's taken a very a courageous leadership, and and especially in the case of ICAO, uh, the Brazilian Forum on Climate Change has taken the position to to challenge the Brazilian government and suggest that it changes its policy, and from what I've heard in the news, it seems that the current minister is listening to those calls. Uh, so I think there can be some rope, hope from, from that end, uh, despite the political crisis that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, in terms of, of your question about creation of, a, of reserves, if that changes livelihoods, 
the Brazil has a very interesting concept of extractive reserves and sustainable development reserves. These are for non indigenous people, uh, these are traditional populations, descendants of rubber tappers, and basically they don't restrict at all the traditional land use systems in terms of forestry, fisheries, and agriculture, and, and so on. So it's, it's a type of protected area which is intended to protect the, the traditional uh, lifestyle of those cultures. So these two categories are okay. It's quite different from national parks or other kinds of protected areas which are very restrictive. Those, yes, then you have conflicts. In, uh, sobre el tema este de la compañera de Perú, eh, sí, en el caso nuestro tenemos un, un trabajo muy fuerte con mujeres, después puedo decir eh, lo que hacemos, pero el, el objeto principal de nuestro trabajo es involucrar a las mujeres. Entonces trabajamos el del público directamente involucrado con el programa este que se llama Bolsa Floresta, el 84% es de mujeres y además es, tenemos un trabajo muy fuerte con el apoyo a, a lideranzas de, de mujeres. Es, yo estoy totalmente de acuerdo con su posición que sí, las mujeres tienen un papel muy importante en el tema este de, eh, de la protección del bosque y también sobre el tema de desarrollo sostenible de una manera más amplia, ¿no? el tema de educación, de salud, porque eh, va más allá que el tema solo de, de reducir las emisiones de la tala del bosque, ¿no? Es un tema más, más amplio de promover el, el desarrollo sostenible, ¿no? Así que podemos hablar. So I just basically said that we, we focus our work on, on, on women to a very large extent, and the Bolsa Floresta program has 84% of its uh, uh, target as, as, as women. So 84% of the recipients and participants of the program are women, so it's focused on a lot on, on, on women, and I agree with her that women play a very important role in, in these dynamics. Yeah, please. So I'd like to respond to the, I'm sorry, the, the woman that's living in, in France now. Uh, well, a couple things. One, I'm American, so I, I, I also uh, have to ask for your apologies for my own president at this moment, and uh, I'm not don't work for the government, and of course, I think in the United States now it will be the one country outside of the Paris Agreement. <laughs> uh, now that Syria decided to join. Uh, second, uh, you know, I, I do think you know Brazil has a, a long history and, and substantial so nine point I think five billion tons of reductions that will be had. It is more than the rest of the world during the KP. You were the number one country you know, emission reductions. And so there is a lot, I think, of goodwill built up uh, and understanding by, by negotiators also, at least from our defense funds perspective too, of the, you know, the efforts that the country of Brazil and all the different actors have made. And so, you know, that needs to be recognized, congratulated. Um, you know, but we've also seen also the kind of limitations of maybe how far that those practices can go. And, and with the recent upticks, of course, and of course, the political crisis aggravating that, that we do need some kind of additional resources <laughs> to help maintain the trajectory that you're on. And thus, you know, a lot of people in the negotiations from other countries, uh, not only so it's NGOs from externally, but of course, I think also internally, are frustrated that the Brazilian government seems to be um, advocating against having an option in the future. Whether you want to use it or not, it would be ideal to have that option that it would maybe have more demand beyond just the Green Climate Fund, $5 a ton. That, uh, and you could have a bilateral deal with Norway like you have with the Amazon Fund right now, but that you know, could pay you more. But of course, you might there be a trading aspect associated. But at least give you the option to have that flexibility to discuss that in the future, because at the moment, you're arguing not to have that option. And so I think that is frustrating, in addition to a lot of your peers throughout Latin America and the developing or uh, emerging markets and developing world. They look to Brazil for leadership on this, um, and you, so uh, you know we would. I think there's frustration by not only, of course, again some of our northern civil society organizations, but also uh, develop your other partner neighboring governments that your the delegations seem to be, or the Brazilian officials in these negotiations again seem to be advocating against having options to generate finance for emission reductions, not only in your own country but their own countries too. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. 
I would add just something to the last question about uh, if Brazilian uh, official positioning and, and negotiations are changing about, about financing. And my answer is that it, it has to change because the Amazon fund suffered a $200 million cut or decrease from the Norway government due to the increase in deforestation in the Amazon in the 2015-2016 period. The Environmental Ministry of Brazil suffered a 50% cut in its annual budget. IBAMA is depending on the Amazon fund and approved a 50 million reais project from IBAMA to run its own activities. And IBAMA is the main agency in Brazil for command and control. So Red Plus is not the silver bullet. It will not uh, save or, or, or resolve all the problems, but could be an alternative that we, we ask to be uh, better considered in the negotiations in COP23. Uh, so we can open a new round of questions, or Chris, feel free to add something. Sorry, I, I, I just have a question real quick. Uh, Red Plus projects, there are a number of them in Brazil. Uh, to my colleague uh, who discussed 6.2, 6.4, would those factor in somehow into that? Uh, maybe add that to the set of questions that might be answered in the next round. So how would Red Plus projects that might be operating in Brazil and potentially use Article 6? Is there an option in there or not if we're talking about, you know, again, Red Plus in Brazil? Thanks. Well, the current problem is that uh, the uh, Red uh, Committee in Brazil has passed a new uh, legislation saying that cannot have a market-based instrument. And there is no nesting, like in Peru, and I think maybe there was a question about Peru. Um, uh, so there is no nesting. So currently what is happening at the project level is completely uh, outside of the NDC. is a voluntary market. And then this is an issue that uh, the state of Acre, which is more advanced in its negotiations with California, has pressed the Ministry of Environment to change its position so as to allow for those credits coming from the Acre Red Program to be accounted for and, and be eligible for international transactions. And this is an area of conflict and dispute. The, the state governments in, uh, in Brazil have had a, a history of conflicts with the federal government because um, since the federal government is the only one allowed to negotiate at the national level, it's the federal government's position that, take, that makes, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, its way to, to the negotiation table. But when it comes to action, right, at this moment, it's the state governments that are most responsible for reducing deforestation. So the, what the state governments are saying, well, we have the task and the job to do, but we don't have the funds and we don't have the voice at a negotiation, so there is an imbalance there, and this imbalance results in these conflicts. And recently, Minister of, the Minister of Environment of Brazil has been pressed by uh, various governments, to, governors, to, to change its position. And this is not new also. This has happened for the last 10 years or so. Do we have another one from the audience? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I'm Camila Moreno. I'm researcher at the Federal Rural University of Rio. Uh, and my point is that um, our civil society in Brazil is not monolithic. So uh, there is an extensive list of civil society organizations, universities, and especially the largest Brazilian social movements and unions that have signed a letter to the government to maintain its historical position against offsets. So I'm, I'm worried that the idea of, that is being passing you know, in, from the panel is that there, this is a, like ideological thing of the negotiators. No, there is a support from the Brazilian civil society, a large part of it, uh, and the critique is that it's, uh, very specifically recognizing the key role that Brazil plays in the national you know, geopolitics of forests, uh, it's what 
skipping the very delicate balance of disagreement because offsets are also an ethical issue. It's not only economical, it's this entire architecture that is at stake. So um, my question would be, uh, I wanted to hear more from you, other than uh, Corsia and the subnational with California, uh, where would you expect that this demand, this massive demand, this liquidity that is out there would actually come from and how this would translate into an investment, as you put it, that is profitable, because I don't see how such big funds would just drop money in the Amazon if it's not to ha receive a return. And so I'd like to, you to elaborate more on this. Do I answer now? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally hear you, and I, it's ex exactly what I said today. <laughs> you know, there is no market, and, and you know, the forest is burning, and nothing is done because there is no price signal. And I'm not even talking about offsets. You know, I, I, I agree with you, and I agree, well, to some extent, that offset, you, you, there is a real ethical question around that. I'm just talking about price signal, which is a very different thing. I'm not trying to bargain, I'm just trying to say that if you want to change the way the whole economic system is putting money into something, you need to change the economics. And so you need to give a price signal. That can be a tax. That can be uh, some kind of, uh, of bonus, if you wish. But you, you need to give a price incentive to make every, all the economic changing into the, the, the good way. So yes, there is no demand today. You're right. And, and, th and this is why there is no action. And this is why there is no funding. So yes. And so something must change, but I don't know why. But I can tell you that today, no money is going to flow into these activities without a clear signal, being offset, being taxes, being uh, you know, uh, bonuses, being whatever. Uh, so I totally agree with you. And, and that's quite a concern, to be honest. Can I, can I respond real quick to that? Um, so Unfortunately, the negotiators are, though, uh, promoting offsets through 6.4 and their market negotiations at the moment, where they're advocating for no double counting by new projects under the sustainable development mechanism and advocating for CDM to continue. So the government of Brazil is, is advocating for offsets, and by not, it's, it's a bit ironic, I think, even though, we, and actually, red is a cap sector. So red is not offsetting anything if it's, if it's capped, and we're coming from national programs. That's the difference between red projects and national programs is you have a sector just like Brazil that's reducing beyond below the reference mission level, and it's being traded between another sector that's been capped in another country, let's say your economy wider, et cetera, you're not offsetting like let's say traditional classical CDM style things, which again, Brazil is now advocating for in 6 point, through 6.4. So, Please keep that in mind. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'll just compliment, uh, just, oh, just compliment that, that question uh, from, from Camila. Uh, I think you, uh, you pointed very well that um, there are different schools of thought, different perspectives on this issue from different parts of the Brazilian society. And uh, there is a, a very significant group that is uh, around a, a the name of Carta de Belém, which is an umbrella movement that has a different position. And I think actually what is needed, my sense, is more dialogue between different opinions, because at the end of the day, most of us have a very similar view. Uh, it's just a, a question of tactics. For example, uh, if we oppose the use of red in the Corsia mechanism, we may not be aware that uh, what is being used is CDM uh, that come from hydroelectric dams of Brazil with the, uh, which are going to fund the same groups that are being now prosecuted in Lava Jato. So the question is, is Red Plus done in a fair way better than funding for hydroelectric dams in the, in the Amazon? I think it is. So I think maybe if we look at our neighbors in Colombia and in Peru, what the Indians uh, uh, movements are saying is 
very progressive, very sophisticated, uh, the COICA proposal for the red indígena is very, very sophisticated and very positive for indigenous people. So I think the question uh, of the debate in the, in the Brazilian society should be not for or against red, but as the indigenous people uh, under COICA have phrased, it's what kind of red? I think all of us uh, would agree that we're not arguing for cowboy type of, of, uh, of uh, uh, red transactions that do not result in benefits for the people, but rather on the opposite. And none of us, uh, I think, would argue for uh, not doing emission reductions through improving efficiency in renewable energy. What we're saying, and I think we, sh we should be able to come to a common ground on this, is that in addition to doing what the Paris Agreement pledges have called for, uh, we, we need to do more. And this additional thing should be done through RED, because RED is much better than carp carbon capture and storage, which is what is being promoted by the oil companies. And uh, RED, I think, has many other benefits. So I think it's, it's a great opportunity for us, and we're at the right time to have bridges between uh, environmental organizations. For example, Greenpeace, I think, should also uh, move in the direction of incorporating certain types of offsets under certain conditions, additional to emission reductions. I think that's a, a new debate that needs to be uh, put on the table, and I think time is ripe for this. Uh, and I think this COP, I think, given the, the data that is coming from uh, rainforests, I think it's, it calls for a new look and a new approach to, to those themes. So b before going to the next question, uh, Thiago, do you want to add something really briefly, please? Yeah, because we have five minutes and a lot of questions up on, in the on the comments here. Uh, there is an important thing when we look at the CDM and, and see that as far as I can see uh, in the position of Brazil, those, those CRs at the moment are not then going back into the accounting system through a corresponding adjustments of any kind, not even in the Copenhagen, so in the nationally appropriate mitigation actions that Brazil put forward for 2020. I'm not even sure if they are proposing that this is done after 2020 in the Paris Agreement. So there is a bit of a, well, it's hard to understand these standards that are being used uh, from one side and the other. So I think communication is certainly one key thing that is needed so that we can understand the views and can debate those properly. Thank you, Thiago. We have five minutes to finish in the event. We have one question down there and one here up front. So who could please be really brief on the question. Yes, hi, my name is Harlem. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, actually, I'm, I come from Peru, from an organization called DAR. Uh, rights, environment, and natural resources. And actually, my question was about how to reframe red, actually, in terms of different ecosystems in our countries, because usually when we talk red, we talk uh, the Amazon. I'm from the Amazon, so I'm really happy about that. But then, you know, I was just a couple of weeks ago in a seminar about Brazil, and even though deforestation has decreased in the Amazon region, it has increased in the Cerrado region which also has natural vegetation. So how do, we, how do you approach that? Because that's also an issue back at home. And the second question was really quick. I just wanted to know a little bit more, if it's possible, about this nesting that apparently is happening in Peru, because I, I, like, I haven't really heard much about it, because it's been like a civil society struggle for the past few years. Thank you very much. And then the last question here uh, up front, please, Fernanda. Hi, my name is Marshall from Greenpeace. It's just a, firstly, just a correction. Greenpeace is absolutely against uh, offsets and uh, the latter, maybe the other speaker, Camila, have mentioned it. It's not just about Carta de Belém, but it's about a more than 50 uh, social movements in Brazil have signed uh, uh, against offsets or support in the Brazilian government position, including Greenpeace. As well, but uh, my question is is about uh, the relation of what is discussing here and our current situation in Brazil. And uh, I will read to be clear. And uh, the fourth uh, right now uh, under a huge attack in the Brazilian go Congress and uh, also to the government. 
And uh, so while we are here, they are trying to pass laws to reduce productive areas, amnesty, rolling back environmental and indigenous rights. And uh, my question is how this proposal could link or try to help to fight against that because we have one problem happen right now when you are discussing here. Thank you. Uh, from I mean, from the Sahad, I'm not the best quest, the, the best person to answer about because it is um we work basically in the Amazon. Uh, I know that Brazil has submitted its federal uh, reference level for Cerrado so far, but we don't we don't work in Cerrado. Not sure if someone wants to talk about that. Yeah. Well, but, but my colleague from Peru, I think this this simple answer is that it should be land use change. Uh, that we talk about not only deforestation. If we substitute Cerrado for agriculture, there's a, a loss of biomass, and that loss should be accounted for. Ideally, I think from a conceptual point of view, we should look at landscapes. So at the landscape level, what are the changes in land use, and how do these changes, uh, what do they mean in terms of color, carbon balances and, and, and carbon budgets? That's, that's, that's my take. Um, as, as far as the uh, question from Marcio Greenpeace, um, I, I agree totally with you. I mentioned that, that we are in a big uh, uh, crisis right now politically, and we are under attack by the Brazilian Congress. I think how does this relate to this debate? I think uh, we should try to, to have a un as unified as possible a vision from civil society in a way that bridges all these differences that uh, currently exist so that uh, uh, when this debate goes up to Congress, we present uh, a vision which is more constructive. What I see as a possible uh, dialogue is that if we have a way of creating value for forest carbon, as Yuvain mentioned, maybe not necessarily only through offset, maybe not necessarily through market, but through a tax, a carbon tax, as as Sihki is very much argues for, I think that's, uh, uh, which is a Brazilian for on climate change. I think that could be a way of doing it. I think what the obvious thing to me is that it, we sh cannot continue with a, a, a zero value for uh, forest carbon. And because this is, is the wrong price signal that we're giving to society. We can burn the forest and in a way we privatize the profits and we socialize the losses. That's what's happening. And that can no, no longer continue. And I think what is needed is a very broad coalition in Brazil saying that we need to create a value for forest carbon. And this value has to improve livelihoods of people. And that's the short answer to a very complicated problem. Yeah, again, same answer. I think it's not about offsets, about price signal and uh, whatever it is. As long as the price signal is good and, and visible and, and long term, money will flow in the direction. You know, people are just economically, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it works. And Cerrado, uh, um, yes, it, it's, it's indeed something uh, interesting. We, we, we're not looking only at the Amazon, in, indeed, we are looking at the, the landscape, uh, landscape stage. We, we've made a couple of investments in the Cerrado region, uh, in a, in um, oh, uh, Minas Gerais uh, regarding um, uh, silvo, agro, silvo, ag, uh, agro silvo pastoral systems with a uh, replanting of macauba, uh, which kind of set or replace some uh, palm oils, so it's native species. Uh, so obviously, a lot of things to do in Cerrado too. Uh, nesting, um, well, what, what I suggest is that you go to the side event organized by the IUCN on Sunday, the 12th, uh, uh, and you, you, you might have some answers. Thank you. Yeah, uh, um, thanks, Marcio, for the question. And I think that my first reaction is that all these setbacks that we are uh, seeing in Brazil regulation, we don't expect that Red Plus could solve this problem. 
what we want to say here is that we need to create a long-term strategy for the Amazon. We need to promote local activities for dealing with deforestation, increase monitoring, increase engage engagement of private sector and local communities. And this long-term strategy has to deal with what would be the long-term financing strategy for this uh, proposal. And Red Plus could help. It will not make everything better. It will not uh, avoid all these huge setbacks that we are facing in Brazil, but could be a good alternative. And there will be carbon mar markets. There will be carbon markets in the Paris Agreement. There will be carbon markets under ICAO. And what's the carbon credits that we want that can join these markets? And how can we get uh, beneficiated for these this carbon markets and fundraise uh, uh, opportunities that is just in front of ourselves. Uh, so I think that our time is over. I just want to thank everyone for being here. It's great to see this room uh, crowded as it is. Thanks for all the panelists, and we are keen to keep this conversation outside. Thank you.